It's just coming up to 10 p.m. here on Six Music. I'm Tom Robinson. It's time for tonight's special two hour feature on the UK Roots and New Music label Cooking Vinyl, which is this year celebrating its 30th anniversary. And to guide us through that epic musical journey, the label's CEO, Martin Goldschmidt, is going to join us after Oyster Band. <laughs>
From the compilation album Cooking Vinyl 1986 to 2016, that's Oyster Band and Hal and Toe. This year, the UK Roots and New Music label Cooking Vinyl celebrated its 30th anniversary. My guest tonight is a man who has steered that label on its journey across three decades of unimaginable change in the record industry, from the world of HMV, Our Price, Virgin Music and Harlequin, through to the world of Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music and beyond. Martin Goldschmidt, welcome to Six Music. Tom, it's lovely to be here. Hi. So it is, it is an amazing 30 years when you look at what has happened in that time. I can't believe that it's my job. You know, I feel I should be paying to go to work. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, for an independent label to stay afloat across that period of time is quite rare, especially given the huge catalogue that you've managed to carry down across that time. Yeah, we, we've seen, um, unfortunately, lots of them come and go, and, and we've survived, but, uh, I mean, it's, it's just, I, I don't know, it's just been great fun. I love doing what we do. We'll talk about Oyster Band, who we just heard there in, in a moment, because at the time I was signed to Cooking Vinyl, they were really a kind of mainstra- mainstay of the label. But I think early uh, in in the history of independent labels in the 80s, when, when it was really getting going, we all looked to Rough Trade as the kind of the, the, the linchpin for the indie scene. And when the... Uh, financial disaster overtook Rough Trade and they went bust. It sort of looked like that was the end of independent distribution and everything. Was that a difficult time for Cooking Vinyl too? It was horrendous. Um, we, near, well, we, we, we went bust and uh, we lost a lot of money and my partner and I both decided to just throw it in. We thought we were done. And after a couple of weeks, I just thought about it and thought, I'm going to try to turn this round. And I talked to Pete, my, my partner, and said, you know, I'm going to try to turn this round. And, and he still wanted to leave. So I, I, you know, bought him out. And it took five years to pay off all the debts. It was, yeah. it was horrendous. But uh, thanks to great records like yours, Tom, we managed it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the right thing to say. But, you know, I think for today's generation, it's hard for people to realise that if the record shops weren't there, there was no way to get the music that you had to the consumers. None. No, it's um, it has definitely changed. Um, I mean, when we started, everything was vinyl. You know, nothing was on... CDs weren't, didn't exist. So, and... Uh, yeah, it's and well, actually, that's not true. Cassettes were around; they were doing really well. Oh, I used to love cassettes. <laughs> yeah, so it's um, it's moved a long way over thirty years. Tell us a little about Oyster Band and how you encountered them and what they meant to Cooking Vinyl. Um, they were close friends with uh, my ex partner Pete, and um, he, he was. Uh, they would when we started the label. That was the first band he wanted to sign, and I fell in love with them really quickly. And remember going to... They used to be called the Oyster Cayley Band, and I went to many Cayleys and danced like a lunatic with uh, all these mad folkies, and, well, we had a fantastic time. So we've, we're moving swiftly through here because you've just released a four-disc al- four al- four uh, compilation album box set celebrating uh, down those years. It must have been quite hard, actually, deciding which tracks and artists to include and which not on there but the the next one we have up was i think pretty important pretty early on michelle shocked yep yep and i love the um which which track are we going to play well we've got an actual live recording from the bbc archives which is a better choice than the one i had but the one i had was called who cares and i remember when um, she was in America and we were trying to get the album information over the phone and we were writing down desperately all the track listings and we got to this track and she just said, who cares? So we put that title on the album and it's actually called Ghost Town. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a great song. But this is an even better choice. I was really pleased you found this one in, in your archive, which is uh, Fogtown from the Hackney Empire with, with Rory McLeod, who was... One of the first artists I put... I had a label before Cooking Vinyl called Forward Sounds International, and I released a couple of Rory's records on that. And, um, yeah, he's one of the most wonderful human beings. Yes, we're still in good time, in, in contact. Excellent. This is Fogtown, 1989. 
I'd like to welcome out onto the stage Mr. Rory McLeod. at the Hackney Empire in London featuring Rory McLeod on guest harmonica. That's Michel Schacht and Ghost Town. Our guest tonight is Martin Goldschmidt from Cooking Vinyl. The whole Michel Schacht story in those early years is one that bears repeating, I think. Uh, how, how did you first come across her and how did the Texas Campfire Tapes come to be? Um, my partner, Pete, when we were starting the label, just thought he'd get in a quick holiday he'd left his last job and he went out to Kerrville Folk Festival in Texas and um, he loved the festival he saw lots of great acts there but after, after the main stage had finished people would just sing round campfires and uh, this um, interesting eccentric woman kept popping up and he was sort of captivated by her and uh, he loved what she was doing and said you know do you want to play some stuff into my Walkman and she said, yeah, sure. And she she did a load of stuff into his Walkman, brought it back, and he thought it was really interesting. And he played it to Andy Kershaw, and Kershaw said it was it was really good. He'd love to play it on the radio. So we just thought, 
we got something here. And we, um, we got in touch with Michelle and asked her if we could release the record. She said yes. Um, and uh, that that's how it all started. Kershaw started playing it on the radio. We, we I was um, working as a booking agent then. I, I sort of booked some shows and we brought her over. And it exploded, went to number one in the independent charts, and it became a massive success. What's interesting, though, if you listen to the actual recording, the batteries on the Walkman were um, <laughs> pretty flat. Really? So it was at the wrong speed. So her voice on the album is higher than the way she, she actually is a better singer than she is on the record. <laughs> but it's got so much magic in that recording with the crickets in the background. And it's, you know, there weren't, people weren't playing field recordings in that way at that time. It was a very special recording. It just captured a zeitgeist. But, you know, the other thing is it, it defied conventional wisdom and the music industry. You can't release an album off ordinary audio cassette set because it's running at you know <laughs> even with a good battery it's running at a really slow speed and you've only got like a, a sliver of a millimeter of tape on each side of the stereo and yet does the consumer care not as such it how was, many copies did you sell uh, well we i don't know what it's done now um we lost the rights after about a hundred thousand so that was that was pretty good for something just recorded on a walkman for the cost of a set of batteries um, yeah, it's, it's, it's such an amazing performance and that really comes through. And, and great songs. I think Andy Kershaw also had a connection with this next artist we're going to hear. Um, S.E. is it Rogi or Rogi? Rogi, yeah. Yeah, he's... Um, if, anyone, if you meet anyone from Sierra Leone um, and mention his name, they just sort of salivate. I mean, he's such a legend in that country. And... Uh, I remember, again, to Kershaw turned uh, Pete and I on, on to him, and I went out to San Francisco to um, persuade him to sign to us, and uh, I had one of the worst nights of my life. I remember um, <laughs> getting off the plane, being tired after the flight, and he, he was really hospitable. He took me round town, introduced me to all his friends, and, you know, I was getting tireder and tireder, and, and about 10 o'clock at night, you know, um, he said, well, where do you want to sleep? I said, I, I don't know. Is, is there a hotel around here? He said, yeah, there's one down the road. And he drove me to this place and left me there. And I went in and I was shattered. I kind of bumped into both sides of the door on the way in. And then I noticed that there was mirrors on the ceiling and the TV was on the porn channel. Oh, God, <laughs> and, oh God where am I sleeping? <laughs> and it was terrible. I was so tired. I couldn't sleep all night. I had these visions of crabs running up and down my arms and the floor was matted and I couldn't phone him to get him to come back. I was stuck there. It was horrible. And I, mean, I left the next day. so you could rent the rooms by the hour. And Oh, God, that was bad. Oh, well, this is the, this is the recording is partly the result. So let's see if it was worth it. My lovely Elizabeth. I am deeply worried at heart. I say I'm deeply worried at heart. Cause the girl I love so well, my friend has learned from me. Now I scarcely know what to do But to hang my head and cry For my lovely Isabel Some people say there are many guys That are really crazy after me But I'm not interested in any Save my lovely Elizabeth My sweet baby Isabelle. <laughs> Sweet Elizabeth, but why did you go? Oh, Ruji. 
Little boy sing. I say, Elizabeth, but why did he go? Come back to your loving Roji. Yeah, blacky boy, Roji. Don't you listen whatever they may say. Come back to your loving Roji. From me. Now I scarcely know what to do. Better hang my head and cry for my lovely Elizabeth. My lovely Elizabeth S. E. Roji. Uh, from the compilation album Cooking Vinyl 1986-2016 and picked for us tonight by Martin Goldschmidt, who's our guest through to midnight. So, um, Roji there actually moved to the UK as a, as a result of the support from Andy Kershaw and from Cooking Vinyl. Yeah, and uh, I became his booking agent and he, he was, uh, yeah, he was a lovely guy. I, I, unfortunately, after a couple of, well, we did, um, that album with him, and then uh, I think the last time I saw him was was busking at Hammersmith Tube Station. <laughs> oh dear! But uh, and unfortunately, he died a few years ago, which was really sad. He did some more records with Real World that were really good as well. He's a fantastic player. The last one was called Dead Men Don't Smoke Marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> Still, that's not... a really interesting last album before you die. <laughs> what a great title. Totally. Anyway, S.E. Roji. Um, and before that, Michelle Schacht, who you managed for a period, I, I understand. That's right. And did she... Am I right that she came to live with you and your wife briefly? Yeah, n- not... Yeah, for I think she stayed with us for about nine months after she moved out. Roji moved in. <laughs> but yeah, those were the days. You know, people go on about the good old days. You know, I'm never quite that convinced. I think the good old days are here and now, definitely. So let's move on to the next act that we're going to play from the compilation, and uh, this is the Canadian band uh, Cowboy Junkies. What was your relationship with them? How did you come across them? And uh... A promoter called David Jones sent the tape to us and we fell in love with it. Um, and we got into um, a bit of competition with BMG, uh, well, RCA actually, to sign them. And in the end they decided to sign to RCA, but they loved us and made RCA license the record to us for Europe. And RCA didn't think it would be that big a record. It was done in carrying on the Michelle Schott theme. This one was done in a church for the grand budget of $500 uh, in, a, in, a, in a day. And, and on one special microphone. On, yeah, yeah, that's right. It was a, it, it, Again, it was an incredible performance. Um, and RCA didn't think it'd be that successful, and we, we released it, and it broke out of the UK into Europe, and suddenly they really regretted having licensed it to us. But, but everyone did very well out of it, and uh, it, was, it was fantastic to be involved in that record. It's b- beautiful again. This record was a big one for them, their, their cover of Sweet Jane, and the full thing is 8 minutes 45, but let's give people a taste of it.
absolutely exquisite version of Sweet Jane from Cowboy Junkies on the compilation album Cooking Vinyl 1986 to 2016 picked for us tonight by the label's founder and CEO Martin Goldschmidt it's listening to that it's really hard to believe that it's recorded on one ambisonic microphone in a church and it sounds that good I mean so much stuff today is overproduced and for us we've never been a label that chases hit singles we've always been about you know great artists doing great performances and that song that song really sums it up now the next track i believe was recorded in 1949 so i don't imagine it was recorded <laughs> Unless you had a time machine, there was a direct connection with you and. Well, McCall. now you mention it. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's the you and McCall connection? Well, this was a, a weird one because Peggy Seeger came to see us to do um, a, a best of you and McCall, and I remember at the time saying, you know, we 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 kind of we're really about contemporary folk music. It doesn't fit what we're trying to do, and really, you want to go and see Topic and. So she did, and they wouldn't do it. So I said, well, look, he's really important artist. We'll do it. We'll put it out. And uh, we put it out, and it sold masses. I mean, it was very successful, and it was it was one of those lovely things where we we didn't think it would sell at all, and it, we just did it because we thought he was important. And, um, and it's funny because um, I'm not sure, even sure how many years later, well... Last year, we put out a tribute to you, McColl, so which again the family had put together and come to us to do, and it's brilliant to have had that long relationship with Peggy and and um, Callum and the family, and uh, it was lovely to be able to put put the tribute out uh, record out. Although it took them twelve years to get it together, <laughs> we were talking about it with them for twelve years. <laughs> But was it take, also taking time to get people to actually record the covers of the songs as well? I think... I'm not sure what took all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Diplomatic answer, there. Let's listen to this classic Dirty Old Town. I found my love By the gasworks cross Dreamed a dream by the old canal Kissed my girl by the factory wall Dirty old town, dirty old town Heard a siren from the dark Dirty old town, dirty old town. Clouds are drifting across the moon. Cats are prowling on the beach. Springs a girl. In the street at night Dirty old town Dirty old town What's really interesting about that is that it's from 1949 and therefore from well before rock and roll it was even a kind of... Uh, even a twinkle in Elvis Presley's eye. Or I was. A twinkle <laughs> in anyone's eye. <laughs> or me. And that's uh, not often that happens. So from 1949, um, Dirty Old Town, New and McCall, song made popular by the Dubliners, Rod Stewart, the Pogues, the Mountain Goats, Frank Black, the Specials. Everybody's done that song. And it's you a can, classic. You yeah. can hear why. 
Well, so now, time for me to tell listeners a little story here, because in 1992, I was flat broke. Uh, the, the Tom Robinson Band, the modestly named Tom Robinson Band, had tried a, a reunion ten years after the event, and it was like trying to have a picnic in the same place twice. Um, and it had been a complete disaster. We were at each other's throats pretty much for the whole year of, of it, although a lot of the time I didn't know. Anyway, I, I'd, I'd kind of got lost... A lot of money through it and I'd uh, got completely artistically demoralized and uh, had to go out with a solo with an acoustic guitar uh, playing solo gigs in Ireland to just kind of pay the mortgage and uh, I came back from Ireland with some dat tapes recorded on the desks at those solo gigs in little bars in Ireland and uh, I was introduced to you, Martin Goldschmidt, and uh, I said, well, I've got this sort of album. <laughs> and you said, yeah, well, let's put it out then. And you just put out this album of me live in Dublin, and it completely reinvented me as a, as a solo troubadour. And suddenly I was playing tours in Belgium and around the UK with TV Smith, and uh, I owe you a debt of gratitude for reviving my career. Well, you, you've only told part of the story I'd, I'd stalked you for many years Tom <laughs> had you? I'd, I'd, well I'd put on quite a few anti-nuclear benefit concerts that you'd done I'd hitchhiked from London to Edinburgh to see you play I'd been on the right to work march where you played and you gave me that incredible tape where you played for 25 people and I was one of them so for you to sort of say you can do a record was pretty exciting for me <laughs> <laughs> That's the other side to the story. Oh, thank you. Well, we'll we'll play just a small taster from that uh, Living in a Boomtown album. This was the uh, live version of War Baby, live at uh, Whelan's in Dublin with Kieran Wilde on sax. <laughs> can be so aloof Hanging out with the boys All swagger and toys I don't even care What other people are there I just stare and stare and stare I see a shadow in the swimming pool I see your face in the shaving mirror Time and time and time again I follow your footsteps so quietly up the back stairs And I hope and I pray you ain't never gonna find me there Smooth skin and tenderness long ago in a dark night Wish I could see you once again to remember that it was true I wanna be still beside you, quiet and still beside you Listen to you breathing and feeling The 1992 uh, Live in Ireland version of War Baby from the Cooking Vinyl compilation. Martin Goldschmidt from the label is our guest tonight. And uh, we're just looking back on a retrospective. The al If the label was formed in 1986, and we've only got as far as 92, we'd better start scooting along uh, <laughs> at a reasonable rate here. And uh, next up we have an artist that uh, I toured with as a result of uh, being signed to Cooking Vinyl, Andy White, Jackie Leven and I did a big tour. Um, well, I don't know how big it was, but it was a tour in Germany. And um, we remember it as the Englishman, Irishman and Scotsman tour at the time. How did you come into uh, contact with Jackie Leven? Through uh, Simon Long, at the Sim who was at the Simpkins Partnership at the time, just sent, sent me a tape and I fell in love with it. And it was one of those things where he didn't have a fan base, which was quite hard, but we'd had we'd made a bit of money that year. I loved it, and I just thought I'd love to put it out. Jackie was 
a mess emotionally and it took him a long time to persuade him to sign to us and eventually he did and, and we put it out and it did really well in in germany and in norway and it really took off in both those markets it was a massive success and we i worked with him the whole of his solo career we did over 20 albums with him um until he he died five years ago um but this song i remember i'd just come back from australia and my mum had had died and he um he he uh, he um uh, oh God! What's the word? <laughs> he name checked her on the on the sleeve, dedicated it to to my mum on the album sleeve, which is really touching at the time. Like young Irish men in English bars, song of home betrays us. Call mother a lonely field. Call mother a lonely field. Like truthful glances we exchange. Some of home betrays us mm. Like letters written in the sea Never to be BBC Six Music. In the middle of the night, something musically magical happens when the clock strikes midnight. Something that sounds far beyond mediocre and nowhere near the middle of the road. Six Music recommends. On BBC Six Music. 60 minutes of upfront new music, lovingly hand-picked and passionately gift-wrapped by the Six Music DJs. Lauren Laverne, Tom Ravenscroft, Marianne Hobbs and Steve Lamarck. BBC Six Music. Six Music recommends. Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays from midnight. But if you're too busy enjoying your beauty sleep, you can download or listen to them anytime you like. Anytime you like. On the BBC iPlayer radio app. Hello? Hello? Come back as a man 
for me by day and night. She would be just like my mother, and behind, far behind, wait on all the others, if I had another life. I used to be a tart, sold myself as art. Now I feel just like my mother, her price is low. She doesn't bother. Did she vice versa? It's such a great loss that she died um, this 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 year. I was really yeah, but February. But um, it's the first sort of job I ever had was uh, managing Poison Girls many many years ago. I think it's eighty two. Um, it was it was a job in the sense that it was full time work. I don't know if I. Any money from it? <laughs> but, but, uh, that is one of the requirements. It of the was job. really strange. Age twenty six, managing this forty year old crazy punk anarchist punk woman. It was. Uh, I learned a lot from that. I had some great times. They were, they were lovely. The 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 thing you pick up from Poison Girls and that you know particularly with Old Tart's song which we just heard there is the genuinely dangerous artists are the ones where you they could do anything. There's just that sense that you don't know what they're going to do next. It could just, anything could happen in the next bar. That's a brilliant way to put it, because Crass were the most popular anarchist punk band at the time, who everyone knows about. But um, Poison Girls were definitely number two on the scene. But they were, they could do anything. It was, they were so unpredictable. You know, they brought the whole agenda of feminism to this political scene they i mean they brought the whole agenda that you didn't have to be you know 20 and dressed in black to this political scene they broke every rule they could and their lyrics were incredible musically it's fantastic it was very refreshing with the cookie vine catalog do you manage to keep all the back titles sort of still in print and available in the digital world, that's very easy. <laughs> so, yeah, we do digitally. We keep as much as, poss- as possible physically. Most, most of it is. Um, Poison Girls have actually licensed a vinyl reissue of Where's the Pleasure, which a copy turned up in the post this week. I think a label connected with the Mobs label, All the Madmen. So um, that wasn't... We didn't do that. That kind of just happened, but that's great. But I think, you know, having been in the, what we laughingly call the music business for for 30 years myself, and remembering from the early 70s through to the kind of uh, early noughties, that the big problem used to be that you would you'd pour life life and soul into a body of work. You'd put it out there. Uh, a press run would be done of so many thousand records, and when they were gone, they were gone. Your work evaporated, and the record company, meantime, owned the rights to it. So you couldn't put it out yourself without being in breach of contract, and uh, they didn't want to put it out because it wasn't economically viable. That has happened a lot and is a very unfair situation, but... Coming from you makes me laugh because I remember filling your garage with the whole stock of Tom Robinson records when you left cooking vinyl and going to your 60th and getting them in the welcome pack afterwards. That's right. Yeah, we took it, took away all that stock. <laughs> took it off your hands, Martin, because nobody bought it. <laughs> So um, the good thing is... You, know, you, you kept it in stock. <laughs> I kept it in stock. More the fool, more the fool me. But as you say, in this digital world, 
it's possible to for the for music to have the long tail, so that uh, it remains. So, how much has the industry now changed from this era? We're here in around the kind of late nineties. It's totally transformed. I mean, the late nineties was. This time was just before Napster hit, just before MP3s became exploded, and uh, it was at the time when record companies were reselling everyone their vinyl collection on CD and were sitting very pretty. and And then the bomb went off with Napster and MP3. And suddenly nobody knew what was going to happen next. Well, we'll as we move through the years, we'll, uh, we'll get on to what is happening now, because uh, I think the cooking vinyl digital strategy, strategy is very interesting. It's also interesting that the track that was behind MP3 was actually Tom's Diner by Suzanne Vega, uh, which I, I, I just read the book, How Music Became Free, which I highly recommend. Um, but that was the track they used to get the algorithm right. Because it was just an unaccompanied vocal, so that if there were any artefacts, you could they would be absolutely exposed. That's exactly right. Well, now, Billy Bragg is another major cooking vinyl artist. At what point did he sign to, to CV? He signed to us in 1993, and it was a massive turning point for the label. We'd been struggling for quite a few years um, to pay off debts and, and, and survive, and Billy signing to us helped us a lot financially um more than that it gave us a lot of credibility and also he was one of the inspirations for, for founding the label so it was a triple whammy and um his newest album we'll we'll jump off the compilation here and play a track from the very latest album because he's teamed up with another great friend of this show, Joe Henry, who we sort of love talking to here and he reveals the secrets of production and him and Billy have headed out on the road. Um, well, let's listen to the track first and then hear about the background to the story. Daddy sat me down upon his knee Said, son, you go to school and learn your lessons Don't become no dusty minor boy like me Was born and raised in the mouth of the Hazard Hollow With a cold cough rolling and a rumbling past my door Stand in a rusty row of empty Garcielle and men Don't stop here anymore Used to think my daddy was a black man Scripts enough to buy the company store Now he goes to town with empty pockets And his face is white as February snow Was born and raised in the mouth of the Hazard Hollow Cold cars roaring and rumbling past my door Don't stop here anymore Never thought I'd learn to love that cool dust Never thought I'd yearn to hear those tipples roll Grass would turn to money. Those green 
checks fill my pockets up once more Was born and raised in the mouth of the Hazard Harbor Cold cars roaring and rumbling past my door Now they stand in a rusty row of empty Don't stop here anymore Last night I dreamed I went down to the office To get my paycheck like I'd done before Those kudzu vines were covering up the doorway There was grease and weeds going right up through the floor I was born and raised in the mouth of the Hazard Harbor Cold cars roaring and rumbling past my door Now they stand in a rusty row of empty Don't stop here anymore Wow. Ellen End, Don't Stop Here Anymore by Billy Bragg with Joe Henry from the album Shine a Light on Cooking Vinyl Records. My guest tonight is Martin Goldschmidt of Cooking Vinyl. Um, you should be very proud of that record. I am. It's fantastic. Billy, it, it was a dream of, of Bill's. I mean, he's he's a train nut and he's also a Lonnie, he's crazy about Lonnie Donegan. And, uh, he wrote a book about him, didn't he? It's He has. It's not come out yet, but he has. Um, and uh, that the, um, he did this journey from Chicago to Los Angeles, which is uh, um, the the train line on the Lo- uh, Lonnie Donegan song is about. And they got him and Joe got off at every station and just recorded in waiting rooms different songs the whole way round the line um, for three days. Uh, Billy tells a much longer version of this that's much better than mine, but again, it's fantastic to hear those field recordings. It's fantastic that he's dared to do that. You know, it's 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 just he's followed his dream instead of making a record that's trying to do do something and be in the charts. He's just he's followed his dream. The performance is f- fantastic. I I just love that record. I'm so proud that we've done it, and I'm so pleased Bill's done it. And who would have imagined Billy Bragg? When we first heard him getting his kicks on the A13 <laughs> <laughs> as an Americana artist. I was in Nashville at the Americana Awards this year where he was presented an award on, on stage. And it was very surreal because you know the Americana scene is uh, very much white cowboys and you know but there are women on stage there are black people on stage there are not english people on stage it is so wrong and (laughs) billy pulled it off brilliantly it was so great to see and they they loved him and he did this great speech and billy's a communicator he doesn't lecture he's a communicator and uh, they loved it they were so motivated and it was incredible to see him be embraced by that scene he makes people laugh at the same time as scoring points Exactly. Brilliantly done. So um, we've just got time before it comes up to 11pm and the official start of the after hour to fit in a track by Frank Black.
warriors wait for you. Bounty of eternal fields. Every muscle knot I feel. Robert, tell me what to do. Tell exactly what you're not. Yeah. Tails pushing grand whales. Heads hope to have a stop. Each flag had no sail. Can you believe enough? And the Loyana calls to you. She will never, never yield. Every siren has her spot. Yeah. So tired album Dog in the Sand in 2001 on Cookie Vinyl. That's Frank Black with Robert Onion. And of course, only yesterday it was T-shirt day here on Six Music. And Pixies and Frank Black featured with Steve Lamack. Catch up on the BBC iPlayer radio app available for the next 29 days. Download to your device. Keep it listen at leisure. In an hour's time here on 6, Stuart McConey will be here with tonight's Freakier Zone, focusing this week on outsider artists, including Moondog, George Coleman, The Shags, legendary Stardust Cowboy and Space Lady, among others. And right now, courtesy of Martin Goldschmidt and the Cooking Vinyl 30th Anniversary Box Set, we've got a couple of left field, if not downright outsider artists of our own, lined up for you, starting with Hayseed Dixie, who are next. Gamble, I tell you I'm your man You win some, lose some, it's all the same to me the Pleasure is to play, don't make no difference what you say well, I don't share your greed, the only card I need is the ace of spades The ace of spades, alright Playing for the high one, dancing with the devil Going with the flow, it's all the same to me Seven or eleven, snake eyes watching you So devil if I quit, devil stakes your split The ace of spades, the ace of spades, alright Born to lose, gambling's for fools, but that's the way I like it, baby. I ain't gonna live forever. Yeah, don't forget the Joker. Push 
him the wheat, the dead man's hand again. I see it in your eyes, you take one look and die. The only thing you see, you know it's gonna be the ace of spades, the ace of spades, I got. Absolute classic of its time, Camper Van Beethoven and Take the Skinheads Bowling, very much their signature tune and played to death by John Peel in the early 80s, before which we heard Ace of Spades by Hayseed Dixie, and both of them are on the current compilation album um, celebrating 30 years of the Cooking Vinyl label. Martin Goldschmidt is our guest on Six Music. Those two songs there um, take us very much to uh, particularly the Camp of Van Beethoven, to an era in British music. Yeah, I loved that Camp of Van Beethoven song when it first came out. A, a long, long time afterwards, we, we started working with them and, and got the rights to the whole catalogue. But when it, when it first came out, I was very involved in the whole anti-Nazi league thing. And I remember skinheads running around town fighting with, you know... Anti, the anti-Nazi League and the anti-fascist guys, and uh, it was it was it was um, electric times. It was it was a different era, and that song really captured it brilliantly. Take the skinheads bowling. Just give them a nice time. It was <laughs> rather sweet. Um, I, I suppose younger listeners won't really even remember how terrifying those times were. I remember going to Clash concerts and seeing, as soon as the music started on each song, uh, these skinheads would just come and start assaulting the back row of the audience and pulling them out and punching them and kicking them on the floor. I remember being at a Poison Girls concert in Stroud and seeing the audience being beaten up in time to the music. It was horrendous. Um, there was There's so many incidents... And it was, you know, it was an era where people loved fighting. Uh, it was an era where, you know, there was a serious rise of fascism and the left mobilised and smashed it. It was inspirational 
what happened then with Rock Against Racism, which you played a great part in, and, and I was very involved in as well, and, and the Anti-Nazi League. And um, it for many, many years, the fascist movement after that were in disarray, and it's horrible to see what's happening now with um, the rise of uh, right-wing racist ideology again and uh, right-wing parties and, and Nigel Farage etc it's very sad to see all that coming back in, in Britain and right around the world these days I have to hasten to add listeners that uh, the, the views expressed by Martin Goldschmidt are his own and not those of the BBC um, but uh, thank you very much for sharing them with us Well, night time let her through Yeah, I'm talking to you I wanna see ya Precious little thing With her eyes that dance around Without their clothes So buy a pretty dress Wear it out tonight For anyone you think Could out to me Oh, better steal, be my winding wheel Cause I feel just like a man Without a single place to go of interest And I'm further north and south If I could shut my mouth She'd probably like this So buy a pretty dress Wear it out tonight For all the boys you think Could out to me Oh, bear steel Be my winding wheel Be my winding wheel Well, children laugh and sing A song that ushers in her driving rain And I'm standing in the station Like some old record waiting on a train So buy a pretty dress Wear it out tonight For anyone you think could out to Bless him, Ryan Adams' winding wheel. He was a mainstay of Six Music when we first started in 2002. Ryan Adams was absolutely, you know, you couldn't go a three-hour show on Six Music without getting at least one Ryan Adams track in there somewhere. And uh, that's from the album Heartbreaker in the year 2000. Uh, was that a cooking vinyl album, Martin Goldsmith? It certainly was. And it was another one that, that we loved but didn't see coming, you know. And it's great when you have those hasty dixie was as well we, we, we just really liked the record we put it out and it just exploded we haven't had a chance to to talk about that actually the ace of spades because they they started out doing a tribute album to acdc uh, obviously in 2001 uh, and uh, it was a hillbilly tribute to ACDC. And didn't Sony's lawyers threaten them with some kind of class action or trademark infringement suit uh, if they didn't change the name from AC Dixie? 
I that was before my time. I've, you know more about this than me. I didn't even know about that. Yeah, they were they were they were so close to ACDC. They did just called it AC Dixie, and uh, <laughs> when the so- Sony suits started sending them threatening letters, they just changed it to Hayseed Dixie, and they couldn't do anything about it. Of course, they must have uh, reaped the publishing rewards in any case. Yeah, and they've they've done very well. Um, and I heard that they assured me that ACDC really liked their stuff. It might be true. <laughs> <laughs> So Ryan Adams, then the the former singer with Whiskey Town, as, as he was at the time, a uh, totally unknown quantity. Yeah, we just got sent this and we liked it, and we, you know, it was another one where, fuck it, we'll put it out, and it um, just, sorry, uh, we put it out, and uh, it, I'm it, just, it I'll, I'll just say an yeah, apology yeah. if you had young people or people with impressionable or easily offended ears listening there uh, this is a live radio program we weren't of course uh, able to do anything about that and so please accept our apologies if uh, anybody got offended by that it's an old man. <laughs> The 2009 album Invaders Must Die by The Prodigy. That's Omen, which was co-produced by uh, James Russian, the singer from Does It Offend You? Yeah. And uh, that single won a Kerrang Award for Best Single of 2009, Martin Goldschmidt. Liam's a genius. There's no two ways about it. He, well, I've worked with so many great artists over, over the years, but... He's really special, and and also everyone who works with him. I couldn't believe it when 
they signed to us. Every label wanted to sign them, and they chose Cooking Vinyl. It was such an honour. The record blew. It did so well, and uh, it was so good to be able to repay the trust they'd put in us. Um, but that song, you can see why it did so well. It's just got a hard-as-nails sound to it. Uh, James Rushant, of course, um, his dad, the famous Martin Rushant, producer. That's right, yeah. And uh, James is is a brilliant producer. We we did a, a record with James after this. That's uh, one of those records we've done quite a few that we haven't got justice to. Um, they're 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 tragic. It's horrible. There's we've done quite a few great records that I really love. That just we didn't get away, and uh, that 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 was one of them. Carl Coughlin was another. Um, there's there's a few of them that are really sad, and and then you get the other side where you'll do something like a Ryan Adams, and it explodes. It just takes off under its own momentum, catches that wave. Yeah. Do you have? Do you still do most of the signing at Cooking Vinyl? Are you the A and R as well as the kind of label boss? No. Um, Rob Collins has really taken over on that front from me over the last year or so um, and I still do quite a few but Rob has really stepped up and we've also taken on a guy called Ollie Slaney so we've now got a little A&R team and I'm I'm not doing uh, I'm doing a lot less than half the signings now when you were signing which was right up until last year what was it that you kind of look for do you, ha- do you actually have a definition of what kind of music it is that catches your attention or makes you think, yeah, that's worth taking a punt on, or even if it doesn't sell, we're going to put that out? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we our sweet spot is stuff I like, um, artists that have got a fan base um, and th- artists that have got an edge. It's those those three things. You don't need all three, but if you have, we're very happy. So... But- can you go into a little bit more of what you mean by an edge? Yeah, it it could be the prodigy. Um, it could be Billy Bragg. Uh, it, the prodigy have got. We we do many artists that have got a political undertone to what they do. Um, many of them are at the edge of a movement. You know, Billy Bragg was an innovator. Prodigy, are massive innovators. Um, so I, I think what what it's easy to say what we don't do generally, and yeah, there's, there's exceptions to that as well. <laughs> what but doesn't cooking violence we're, do? We're not about trying to find the next big pop act. We 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 get a lot of stuff on the radio. We do really well on radio, but we don't live or die by radio. Um, and I think the the we've got we. In a minute, we're going to play Groove Armada, and that was a good example where there was a song on that record that we thought was a radio hit. The band didn't want to go with it. We we, we went with what the band wanted, and uh, the album ended up doing... It wasn't a hit, that track, but it was a great song, and the album ended up doing doing really well. And it was the first album they had that didn't have a hit on and they made far more money than the last two albums put together on Sony. It was a fantastic result. Let's take a listen to that track right after this. You're turn to that station. Six Music. It was their seventh studio album. We needed to push ourselves, trying every possible thing that was uncomfortable. But it was the one that transformed R.E.M. from cult heroes to stadium champions. We were more prepared for that record than any previous record. It belongs to other people more than it belongs to you. In a good way, I, I like that. In a new two-part Six Music documentary, Billy Bragg celebrates 25 years of their Grammy award-winning album, Out of Time, with all four original members of the band. In 1991, the stuff that you were hearing on the radio didn't resemble that song at all. <laughs> Looking back, it matches the times. R.E.M. Out of Time at 25 starts this Sunday afternoon at 1 on BBC Radio 6 Music.
Andy Cato and Tom Findlay with I Won't Kneel, featuring Saint Saviour, who, of course, we've known in her own right since then. From that, um, what year would that have been? Sort of 2010-ish, something like that? Yes. <laughs> About Ar- something like that. <laughs> Groove Armada, I won't, f- I won't Kneel. There we go. So that did better as an album than as a kind of hit single with album attached. Management put together a fantastic plot. We worked it for 18 months. The band worked so hard and it ended up selling really well. We got loads of sync income and they ended up making far more money than I think they made on the previous two albums that both had hit singles on. Yeah, it's one of those things, isn't it? You can go, you can have a hit single and go bankrupt you know, very easily. No, it's a brilliant project to be involved in. OK, Audio Bullies. That's a name that we haven't actually conjured with for a while here on Six Music, and but I have, uh, f- I have fond memories of them at the time. Uh, why, why this track, Only Man? This was... Uh, I, I, I love the story to the video of this because we did the track, we got it on the radio, the band were a bit dysfunctional, and um, they anyway, they did this video and they hated it. And they just said to us, we hate this video. We want to spend £30,000 doing another one. And we said, look, the track's been on the radio. It's dead. You're crazy. Uh, they said, we don't care. We're doing it. And they did this video for £30,000. We said, I said to them, you might as well burn the money. And we put it up on YouTube. And then they got a sink. And then they got another sink. <laughs> and they ended up... All, they ended up um, earning hundreds of thousands of pounds in sinks from this track because they did that video. And it's just a lovely example where they followed their own artistic vision and, and they were right. And I'm sure there's loads where it's happened and we were right, but this is one where we were wrong and we have made lots of money out of it. And it was great for the band. Just before we play the track, though, for listeners who aren't familiar with kind of industry jargon, a sink, you don't mean like the thing that you wash the dishes in and <laughs> in the kitchen. No, the Spanish lottery show was the first time that uh, they, they rang us up and said, can we use this music as the theme bed for the Spanish lottery show and sent us a check. And then Lion Bar in Poland followed and then Cornetto in Italy <laughs> followed. And we, they just kept coming in and, it, you know, it's like ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. The, so basically the this watching. is art. <laughs> Artists quite separately from selling records online or downloads or physical things uh, can make income by getting a synchronisation licence with... A, An a advertisement, co- yeah, like or, Lion Bar in Poland. <laughs> or a film. Or the Spanish National Lottery. <laughs> Let's just imagine all of those things while we listen to Only Man by Audio Buddies. <laughs>
down I know it's you by your footsteps on the ground I see a sun being coming down I know it's you by your footsteps on the ground I see a sun being coming down I know it's you by your footsteps on the ground I see a sun being coming down I know it's you by your Only Man from the third album, Higher Than the Eiffel, in 2010. Yes, it was 2010. Martin Goldschmidt is curating the music for us in this couple of hours. What do you think of the word curate? Do you think it's Ponzi, Martin, or is it, is it all right to say? It's the very trendy word right now, isn't it? Curate, playlist, etc. I know. It's the new world of streaming. We, f- we find ourselves using it all the time and then sort of stopping ourselves in mid-sentence. But yeah, the world of streaming... You mentioned earlier on uh, Suzanne Vega with Tom's Diner was the kind of track that was instrumental in helping them iron out the kinks in the uh, MP3 development. Um, can you personally hear the difference between a high-quality MP3 and a 24-bit high-quality digital playback? I don't know. <laughs> um, You've never tried? You, you think you can. Yeah, you think you can. I, but um, it, it, it's hard to say. I think for me, I've always really embraced... I've always been OG. Well, I mean, original geek by that. And uh, I've always embraced this sort of stuff. Uh, I, I, I was... when. Napster 2 came out as one of the first users to to use it and embrace streaming in a big way and it's interesting now because um, many of the records we put out we have a difficult conversation with our artists about streaming and the importance of working with Spotify um, and other streaming services about this and it's it's a really tough subject it's really misunderstood. And there's a lot about it that I don't understand. The economics of it are very hard to understand. The How little you earn per play is, is a nightmare for everyone. Um, and But what we've noticed is that it does really add up. And we do get now massive checks each month from Spotify. So if you've got a catalogue, it's great. If you've got a new project, it's it's much harder. But there's two things I want to say about that. The first is that it doesn't, in a way, matter what you think. It's like King Canute complaining about the waves. It, it just is. It is the new world. It is how more and more people on the planet can discover and consume music. And Especially outside the kind of West as we know it. Well, that's the really interesting thing, is that before streaming, record companies focused on selling music to 4% of the population in the rich 12 countries in the world. I think in five years' time, you're going to have 90% of the world paying for music through streaming. And even though the payment amount is really small, the difference between being engaged with... 4% of 12 countries to 90% of the world, you know, is phenomenal in terms of maths and income potential, but it's also great to be, for an artist, to be engaging potentially with such a wide audience. It's exciting. 
So that's why you do it. <laughs> and of course, if loads of people are streaming your music, you go out and tour, you're not going to play to nobody in the smallest club in town either, presumably. Well, one of the things that we found is, is that, you know, through the streaming services, you, you go out and play and people know your songs. Yeah. With, with a new album really quickly. And it used to be that you'd go out and you'd play the album on release and nobody would know any of the songs and it was a bit awkward for the artist on stage there's a lot better knowledge of new albums now with audiences than than there was and it's a lot easier to go out and play songs from the new album than it used to be it's almost like the days of punk i remember in the 70s there was a there was almost an even divide across musicians across critics across people in the industry between punk and anti-punk you know a lot of people were virulently against this new music and said it's nonsense it's got no worth it's got undertones of violence uh, it's uh, it's destroying the record industry and then there were other people going oh, no i get it that's all right and then people like ian dury and the blockheads graham parker and the rumor elvis costello although they were traditional musicians they got what the punk thing was and jumped gleefully aboard. And it's almost like that with streaming, that certain artists still don't get it, and other artists embrace it. So, uh, Franz Ferdinand reported with glee when they first got to New York and played their first shows, although their record hadn't been played, hadn't been released there. They were going, everybody knew the songs, they'd all, they'd all had the MP3s from Napster. It was brilliant! And they were really happy. No, Domino have always been brilliant at in the streaming world. They're Franz Ferdinand's record label. Um, it's it's really tough for new artists in this world because the amount of money they earn is is, is so little, um, and it it takes a long time to earn money. But I think. It's a tough thing to say, but it's always been really hard for new artists. It's never been easy. You've always had to really suffer for your art, and I don't think I don't think it's got worse. I just think streaming has been a scapegoat for it in a lot of ways, um, and people it, it it it's. But I think it's exciting long term the potential of streaming, and the reality is it's how kids experience, consume, discover music today. So you've got to be in it. You've got to be in it if you want to win it. My guest tonight on Six Music is Martin Goldschmidt. I'm Tom Robinson. Next up, we're going to hear Suzanne Vega right after this. BBC Music's My Generation Season celebrates the 80s, seen through the eyes of the fans and the stars. My music, my memories, my my generation. generation. And continues with Soul to Soul's Jazzy B's take on the decade. The unemployment was difficult for everybody. Coming from a background of life is what you make it, my idea was to be the biggest sound system in the world, almost by any means necessary. Necessary. From musical ambitions to influencing fashion. Soul to Soul created the first definably black British look ever. We were rocking our own fashion, our own identity. Jazzy B's 1980s, from doll to soul. Available now on BBC iPlayer.
from the realm of the Queen of Pentacles in 2014. That's Suzanne Vega with I Never Wear White. Martin Goldschmidt, she's one of those artists who's paradoxically underrated because she's been around a long time. People don't listen with proper attention to the new music and realize just how great the new records are. Look, I'm biased, but I love what she does. Um, that 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 album was fantastic. It was a really special album. That track was um, actually the big frustration because we didn't get that track on the radio, and I th I think it was a standout track on the record. We we had other tracks on Radio Two playlist. We had her on. <laughs> Interviewed her around that time. I must yeah, say, definitely. And, and her new albums uh, f that we've just put out this year is really good again about the life of Carsten McCullough, who's a s very interesting character, um, author, American author, uh, at the time of Harper Lee and stuff like that. And uh, that's a fascinating story. And she's going to be doing a play about it next year as well, which hopefully will make it over here. So we can't let you go, Martin Goldschmidt, without playing uh, something by Amanda Palmer, who's uh, a kind of core artist for us on this show, and uh, for you too, I believe. Yeah, we met, we bumped into Amanda before she did her incredibly successful Kickstarter campaign, where she raised over a million dollars, and um, we released the record after that campaign and we we did it in a kind of white label mode because she didn't want to be associated with a record company and we've been working with her ever since and just developed a better and better relationship and um she her live shows are phenomenal she Aren't has just she always has special guests on that blow me away i never know who it's going to be and you know, it was someone from our office. It was Scroobius Pip, who I love. It's uh, another artist she had on was Kate miller Heike, who I had no idea who she was, and I signed her very soon after seeing her as a special guest for Amanda Palmer. She and this, she does so many brilliant things in her live show. The best crowd surfing I've ever seen uh, with. Um, a dress that encompasses the whole audience and so many she's very very theatrical got a, got a great vision she's also got an incredible approach to business in that um she doesn't believe in charging money she believes in her fans supporting her and she's more um understanding of this concept of fan engagement than virtually any of the artists i've ever worked with so that as a result of that she was able to deliver a brilliant kickstarter campaign where she started out as a as a statue um you know those statues that just stand in the square all day and you give money to and so she, her whole thing has been about doing something and people giving her money and that led to her really understanding about how, what fans want and how to engage with them hence the most successful music kickstarter campaign ever now she does stuff on um th this website patreon where um, she's got a whole number of people, I think 7,000 people who pay her for 
everything she does. So in advance of doing anything, she knows she's going to earn money from it and she knows what she's going to earn each year. And it's well worth artists checking out this website, Patreon. It's also well worth looking at things like Kickstarter and Pledge Music because it's really hard to get started and money's really tough when you're starting out especially in the streaming world so you know man amanda's has really shone a torch on how artists can fund themselves and get things off the ground absolutely this is do it with a rock star amanda palmer and her grand theft orchestra <laughs> Drunk and stay the night You wanna dance, do you wanna fight? Do you wanna get drunk and stay the night? Wanna smoke till our throats are sore Break out and then talk and then make out some more Do you wanna dance? Do you wanna fight? Do you wanna get drunk and stay the night? Do you wanna know all the things I do? When I'm all alone and thinking about you Do you wanna, do you wanna, do you wanna, do you wanna Do you, 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 do you wanna go back home? And Amanda Palmer, do it with a rock star. <laughs> oh my goodness, she's uh, she's great. She's I can great. warmly recommend listeners checking out her autobiography, uh, which is the art of asking. And she talks about that those early days as a statue and uh, the whole experience with Kickstarter. And of course, her life has taken a whole new passage now with motherhood. And uh, Lord knows where she's going to go next. Tom, at this stage, can I just apologise to all the artists I love dearly who we haven't been able to play? There's, there's even too many to name check because I know we're in trouble for time here. There's, it's a good reason to check out the box set. Shameless plug. Um, there's, there's so many of them that are, are, are wonderful, and very dear to me that I can't play tonight because of time. <laughs> However, we have talked about streaming. 
and we've talked about Spotify. So I'm guessing that if people head along to Spotify, they can actually hear the entire box set all the way through and sample all those wonderful artists that we didn't get a chance to play. Please, please, please do. This is Passenger. I want to feel the Russian winter I want to go to my Polish grandmother's home I want to see Hungarian lanterns I want to walk on the road that leads to Rome The winds that blow past me Clear as the air that I breathe To be young as the morning You're listening to BBC Radio 6 Music. I've been Tom Robinson. My guest has been Martin Goldschmidt from Cooking Vinyl Records. Martin, you say that you do this because of a passion for the music and looking for stuff with an edge and not primarily for the next pop star. But you've had number one albums, haven't you? The Passenger album this year was a big milestone for us and our third number one album ever. And uh, I'd like to dedicate my hangover from last night to uh, the good gig that uh, Mike did at uh, the Apollo, which was a brilliant show, and they were great fun afterwards. And I love working with him and his management. It's been a fantastic campaign. It was, it was a landmark for him as well, because he's never had a number one album. He beat out Bruce Springsteen, and if you go on YouTube, you'll see 15... Springsteen covers by Passenger. He's, he's probably his favourite artist on the planet. <laughs> oh, my guest has been Martin Goldschmidt. As I say, the label Cooking Vinyl is currently celebrating 30th anniversary. Triple album, compilation album released yesterday, and there's a series of showcase gigs at the Lexington in London from Monday through to Wednesday this coming week. And... Uh, my guest next week will be another artist who's been released by Cooking Vinyl, also celebrating three active and productive de decades of music making, Andy White. Join me back here tomorrow evening at six for now playing Six Music. The hashtag is Style6Music. And next up on the Freakier Zone at midnight, Stuart is focusing on outsider artists. And who qualifies better than the featured vocalist on this final track from the Cooking Vinyl 30th anniversary compilation, Soul Man by The Orb, Featuring Lee Scratch Perry.
I did not build this world in a hurry. God is a soul man, and the beginning God made man is no image. I want you to have the knowledge. He's a sick soul man, with the knowledge in his soul. Six music. 